Hello, this is Roxanne Truon again with the MSU Science Festival. We're in our eighth presentation of the day for the Going Digital MSU Science Festival. And I am happy to say Kristen Dage is here to talk about exoplanets. So I'll turn it over to Kristen. She'll tell us a little bit about how she got interested in exoplanets, what her job is at MSU and what she likes about it. Take it away, Kristen. Thanks. Hi, uh, I'm Kristen. I'm a grad student in the physics and astronomy department and I'm about to get my PhD in a couple of months. Um, one of the things I really liked about astronomy was like being able to look at data and connect it to things in real life. And I wanted to talk about exoplanets because I think they're really interesting and I wanted to talk specifically about how we find them. So I have a little demo that I set up. Um, so I have a star right here. It's a red giant star. And I got a couple of planets. So I wanted to get different sizes of planets. So I got this really small one. I have a little bit bigger planet. And then here's another planet. It's a bird I got from Hawaii, but it's round. It'll do the job. And then a dinner plate, which will be a flat planet. And then finally, I got a really, really big planet right here. So we're going to try these. And so two of the important things about planets are how big they are, but also their distance from the star. So I thought we would try it. We'll start with this planet and we'll increase in size and we'll see how the light from the star changes as the pan planet pass passes in front. That's a hard phrase to say. So you can even see right here, my little tinfoil ball is blocking the light, but let's move it closer and see. I'm going to go here. So it's not really affecting the light. Oh, there we go. So it's blocking it a bit. I'll come over here, about halfway through. It's blocking it again, but probably not as much. And all the way over here. Ooh, yeah, that was almost an eclipse. Okay. So now we will try with the bigger planet, the coconut. We'll go right in center. So that's one orbit close by. And we'll try about halfway through. Pass in front again. And then we'll come all the way up here. Ha, that almost blocked it out again. Okay. All right, next planet, the bird. The bird in front, light source. The bird blocks it. Back, now the same distance halfway through. So if you were an astronomer and you had a telescope pointing at the star, what would you see? You would see the star at a consistent brightness, and then the planet would come in front, and it would go away, and then it would come back again. Okay. We'll try the second to the last planet, the flat planet. I'm going to try it up close again. Ooh, that really blocked it out, didn't it? There we go. So we'll come further out here. All right, so this is a pretty big planet. Then, yeah, total eclipse. All right, now we're going to try the last planet, the one I'm most excited about. We'll start here. We'll go in front. <laughs> and then we'll just try it all the way out here. It's going to do the same thing though because it's so big. So that's how the relative size affects it. But you see that the distance matters too, especially in the case of the smaller planets. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is that how fast the planet is moving is directly related to how far away the planet is from the star. Um, this is actually one of Kepler's laws. And I thought we could test this out at home too. So we can pick a star. I'm going to do this because I'm afraid of tripping on the cord. But if I start close here and I run around, I'm coming around a lot faster every time here, but if I were to go further out, it would take me a lot more time to make one revolution. And we can see this in our own solar system too. Um, so the Earth takes 365 days to make one revolution. But if we go closer into the sun, like Mercury, 
Mercury is moving a lot faster and makes a lot more turns around the sun at the same time than the Earth does. And if we go all the way out to Neptune, which is one of my favorite planets, Neptune takes a really, really, really long time to make it all the way around the sun. So Neptune is moving very slowly. So when we're actually looking at data, I have a plot of some real data to show you here. Let's see. So this is an exoplanet light curve. And what you're looking at is on the y-axis, it shows a bunch of plots, measurements from a telescope of the brightness of the star over time. And each of those dips is from the pl planet passing in front. And you can see there's two different size dips. So these two dips are probably from the same planet. And then this dip is from a different planet that's probably bigger because it's blocking more of the light. Whereas this is a little shallow dip, so it's probably a smaller planet. And then the other piece of information is you can see how within the length of this observation, this dip repeated. So that means that this same planet has passed twice in front of its star over the course of the observation, but this planet only moved in front once. So that means that this planet is further out and this planet is closer in. So if you have any questions about exoplanets, let me know. <clears throat> I have one uh, question. How many exoplanets have been discovered so far? So the first exoplanet ever discovered was actually only found in about 1995. And since then, they've just like ramped up their game and they've found thousands of them at this point. Okay. Does each star have more than, have they discovered more? I guess we saw the graph discover more than one exoplanet per star like our solar system has? Yeah. Um, I think there was a really cool system in TRAPPIST where they found like six or seven planets around it. But so something else that's interesting is that this detection method for exoplanets is more sensitive towards larger planets because the larger planets block out more of the light. So it's easier to see that. If you think back to like our little planets, they didn't always block out a lot of the light. So they're harder to find. So we're actually missing a lot of smaller planets, but we're finding most of the planets that we have found, I believe are more like Jupiter types of planets, those are the most common for us to find. It doesn't mean they're the most common out there, that's just what we're sensitive to finding. And again, how do you find these exoplanets? Do you use a telescope? Do you use, is there another method that you use? So you need a telescope to measure it, but there's um, two different types of measurements you can make. So one is looking at the data I just showed you of watching a star to see if something passes in front of it and blocks out its light. But the other method, um, uses the Doppler effect. So the Doppler effect just says if you pass by something, you change the light or the sound. So if you imagine like a car zooming by where the, um, the sound of the car will start off low and then go high or sirens passing. So that's called the Doppler effect. And it has the same effect on sound as it does on light. And so when you have a system of planets orbiting a star, so the star has, um, you know, the star has gravity, right? So it's enforcing gravity on all of the other planets and they're going around it. But those planets have the same amount of um, gravity. So one of Newton's laws is for every action, there's an equal but opposite reaction. So the force of gravity that the star has on the planet, the planet is pulling back on the star. And so if you have <clears throat> enough planets, they actually tug the star just a very little bit, but it causes the star to wobble and even our own sun does this. And so another way you can look for exoplanets is to look at the wobble of the stars. And then you can calculate from there like what kinds of masses would be pulling on the star. Uh, let's see, I have a couple of questions that have come in. One is from Erin, she likes your bird. So if you want <laughs> to bring your bird over to show people. It's a pretty green parrot. <laughs> There we go. And then Rihanna has a question. Why is Neptune your favorite planet? Um, so if there's no green planet. If there was a green planet, then obviously it would have to be my favorite. I guess the Earth is a green planet, but I feel like it doesn't count. Um, <laughs> but 
that Neptune is my favorite because it's blue. <laughs> so not a good one, but Rufus doesn't answer. So. <laughs> All right. Um, Diane has a question from her daughter. She, she would like to know what's the closest exoplanet to Earth? So the closest exoplanet to us is around the closest star to us. And the closest star system to us is called Alpha Centauri. And Alpha Centauri is still pretty far from us. It's, um, a little bit over four light years away. I'm going to put Rufus back. Because he's not so the closest star system to us is about four light years away. So that means that if you're traveling at light speed, it would take about four years to get there. Um, and they did discover some planets around stars in that system called Proxima Centauri. Cool. All right. I think that's, we're ready for more questions. So if you want to continue on, um, maybe tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, what's your day like at MSU when you're studying exoplanets? So I don't actually study exoplanets. I study black holes. That's right. So <laughs> that's interesting. So tell us about black holes. What, so how I see studying? them mostly in x-rays. And the thing about black holes is they don't give off light, right? So I can't study them like we study, you know, like my fake star because there's no light. But what we can do is we can look at how um, black holes interact gravitationally via things that do give off light. And so that's what I do. So I use x-ray data from x-ray telescopes and optical data from like SOAR telescope. Ah. And so I guess, can you describe for people who may not know, there are different types of telescopes out there as opposed to, I always just think of the telescope you have, you know, that you just look through and see things, but there's other ways of looking at the sky. Yeah, so light is broken up into a lot of different wavelengths. <clears throat> and the only wavelength we can see is optical, but x-rays are, x-rays and ultraviolet are more energetic than optical. So the best way to think about light is to think about a rainbow. So a rainbow has all of the colors of light spread out and it has red light and blue light. So blue light has a very short wavelength <clears throat> and it's more energetic than red light. And so if you kind of imagine extending that out and going past them, there's ultraviolet, which means beyond violet. And that's a more energetic form of light. And then beyond that, there are x-rays and then gamma rays. And then there's also cosmic rays, which we don't know too much about. And then if we were to go to lower energies, below red light, there is infrared. And then there is microwave and then radio. So you can actually use microwave and radio signals to study the universe. And one of my favorite papers that came out was these people at a microwave observatory were trying to figure out this really weird signal that they saw every day around noon. And they were detecting somebody microwaving their lunch. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> and you also study star clusters. Do, do they kind of go hand in hand with black holes or... Well, that's what we're not sure of. Um, so that's the big mystery is star clusters are really, really old. <clears throat> so stars, not all stars live for a long time. So the star's life is directly related to how massive it is. So if you have a very massive star, uh, it's kind of like um, uh, driving a big car, like a, driving a big tank, right? Yeah, they're huge and they can carry a lot of fuel, but they're not fuel efficient. So they run out of fuel very quickly. And then there are other stars, um, stars like our sun are kind of fuel efficient and will live for a long time, but then there are other stars that will live for even longer because they're very, they know they don't have a lot of fuel, so they're careful with it. And star clusters are older populations. So when they were, when the stars in them were first born, there was like a mix of like blue stars and like red stars. But then as time went on, all the blue stars died off and probably became black holes. And the stars left in the star clusters are the old ones. And so when you have a population of older stars, you would expect there to be black holes in there. 
But what people have been arguing is that because um, it's a dense place, so we're talking about hundreds of thousands of stars kind of packed in tightly together. So what they're saying is because it's so dense and there's gravitational interactions, the black hole should be kicked out. And so like somebody argued that in 1970 and people have come along since then and said, well, maybe there are some. And so that's what we're looking for. So it takes a long time to, de to study black holes and figure it out. <laughs> yep. I well, do have, have another question regarding black holes. Um, Alyssa has a son that wants to know what happens to light in a black hole. That's a really interesting question. Um, so part of the issue with black holes is that they kind of, anything that gets too close gets gobbled up and can't escape. <laughs> the only thing that could possibly escape is something called Hawking radiation. Um, it's not something we can observe, it's theoretical. But um, yeah, from as far as we know, like light just gets trapped and can't escape. Um, yeah, I hope that answered the question. I think so. All right. So um, I'm looking through the questions here to see what else we have in line. Um, so was last year, wasn't there a discovery about a black hole? I seem to remember yeah, when the was festival was happening, there was all excitement about a black hole. Yeah. So that was a supermassive black hole. So a lot of galaxies have supermassive black holes <clears throat> at the center of them. So when we measure masses of objects, we actually use the mass of our own sun as a reference. And um, so like we, I, the stuff I study is like maybe 10 solar mass black holes, but that black hole was one that was hundreds of thousands of solar masses. And so those kinds of huge black holes live at the centers of galaxies. So we have one at the center of our own galaxy, but there's another galaxy called M87 that has the black hole too. And they were actually able to image not the black hole itself, but what the black hole is doing to the matter around it. <laughs> so what happens is black holes can um, steal matter and material from a nearby star. And then that will create what's called an accretion disk. And so it's all the plasma that it stole from a nearby star just swirling around the black hole. And what they what was so cool is that they were able to image that because it's really tiny. Um, but the way they did it was really neat too. So all of the radio telescopes around the world all pointed at the black hole and looked at it. And they had just a huge amount of data that they had to reduce. And then they got this image and it was cool because the image looked pretty much like theorists had predicted. So that means that we understand a bit about how these work. Awesome. And is it true, um, I guess you always hear about being sucked into a black hole if you get into <laughs> one, is that a true statement? Does that really happen? Well, it's never happened to me, so I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so gravi the gravitational force of the black hole is so strong that if you do get too close you won't be able to escape and so there's something called the short shield radius and it, you can calculate it. it's based on the black hole mass and it's a radius beyond which you can't escape the black hole and fall into the center and then from there again like we don't know but it's theorized like the gravitational force is so strong that you'll get spaghettified and you just kind of get stretched out. Like longer that. and longer. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what else to ask. In regard to exoplanets, um, so there's thousands out there, I guess everyone wants to know, do you think there would be a case for having a planet that you could survive on or that would have water like where we would be considered an exoplanet if somebody was studying us from a different um, galaxy, universe, yeah. So the term exoplanet, what it's short for is extrasolar planet. <clears throat> so it means planets outside of our solar system. So if somebody else was in a different solar system, we would definitely be their exoplanet. Okay. But there's some, this idea of something called the Goldilocks zone. 
So you can't be too close to the planet, to the sun, because then it's too warm, but you also can't be too far away because then it's too cold. So you want to be in a spot where it's just right. And so the earth is in the Goldilocks zone. <laughs> so that has to do with, I believe, like the type of star. So if it's a very big star versus a very small star, and then we want to know the radius, but we know how to calculate how far the planet is from the star based on how many times it comes around, right? The period. Right. So we can use that information. Um, and then the kind of the, one of the issues is that we need to be able to study the actual planet in detail to find out what it's made of, you know, is it like a rocky planet or is it going to be a gas giant? Um, but there are ways to study that. And it's, um, it's hard to do because you need good data. And so if you have stuff that's too far away, you're just not going to have like the resolution to be able to do it, but you can actually take spectra. So um, a spectrum is when you split up the light that comes in and it tells you if it's at certain energies and it means that it's certain chemicals. So you can, you, you can basically find the chemical composition of certain planets. Just by looking at the light, the light spectrum, you can tell what whether it's made of rock or a gas planet or. Yeah, because it, um, if you know if it has a gas planet, it's going to have similar chemicals to okay. our gas planets. Okay, cool. I have somebody um, that just was shouting out that uh, I don't know if it's a question, but it has um, super moon. I don't know if you can talk about super moons. If you know anything about super moons. So I do know that they found something um, orbiting our moon. So we have a second moon. And then there's also planets like Jupiter that have multiple moons. <clears throat> but I think super moon is actually a term for one of the phases of the moons. So. So can you see moons on exoplanets or is that too small of uh, they're too, objects? Usually, yeah, usually they're too small because <clears throat> we're lucky you know, just to see the planets. Yeah, that's true. It kind of depends on how far away the planets are from us yeah. more than anything else. Yeah, okay, cool. Mm. Do you wanna hear about some of my favorite exoplanets? I do. So there's a few really cool ones. <clears throat> One of them, Kepler 16b. It is a planet that orbits two stars like in Star Wars, Tatooine had two stars. <laughs> <laughs> so that planet is out there. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, awesome. There is a super Earth. And so it's a planet the size of Earth, but it's so much more dense that the gravitational pull is stronger. And then there's also one where it's less gravity, which is cool too, um, because it, it's like maybe a similar size, but it's less dense. And so there's less gravitational force on you. <clears throat> Um, there is one that everything is red. Um, and they found this by looking at a spectrum. <clears throat> and then there's also a planet that has no star. So it's always nighttime there. And how do you decide that it's a planet and not a star if it's not associated with a star? I'm not exactly sure how they found it, but planets don't make their own light, right? They reflect the light of the other stars. Right. Just like the moon is not its own light source. The moon is reflecting light from the sun. So I have no idea. I would actually be really interested to know how they discovered it. But. And do you think it was a star that exploded or, and it just is a remnant of it or? So usually when stars explode, they've conformed black holes, neutron stars or white dwarfs. So the way that planets form is, um, different and it's not something we fully understand yet but it basically seems to have something to do where you have like this big debris and then kind of like a little bit like um rolling a snowball so you have a bunch of debris around and then something is like collecting it together and compacting it ah, okay so that's something that's still being actively studied so. there's always something new to learn about the universe that's for sure do you have a favorite black hole? I know you said the Milky Way has one. Can we, since we're part of the Milky Way, can we take a telescope and see the black hole? 
Um, so one of the things how we found out that we even have a black hole <clears throat> is for about 20 years, a group of people at UCLA studied all of the stars around the black hole. And what they found is all of the stars were being pulled by something invisible. So they were moving, moving as if they were orbiting something, but you couldn't see the thing they were orbiting. And eventually they traced full orbits of the stars and they used that information to calculate the mass of what was pulling all of them. And that's how they measured the mass of our black hole. Okay. So the thing about black holes is that if you think there's a black hole, you call it a black hole candidate. And it's only for sure a black hole if you can measure its mass. And how do you measure its mass? Um, typically by looking, the only really, there's a couple of ways, but the best way is if you can measure the mass of the things that it's influencing. Okay. Or yeah, sorry, measure the motion of the things that's influ influencing and for the mass by that. Um, and then there's a technique called reverberation mapping, which has to do with studying the different light and um, how it travels on different paths. And you can make calculations that way, but it's hard. <laughs> you need a lot of data to be able to do that. And do you have a favorite black hole? Hmm. That's a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> I have a second favorite black hole. <laughs> What's a black hole candidate? Uh, um, this one is in, it's called 47 Tuck X9. And it's in a globular cluster in our Milky Way. <clears throat> and it's really special because the black hole is orbiting a really, really small star. So because it's orbiting a really small star, they move very quickly around. If it was a bigger star, they would be further out and they would be going like this, but it's a small star and they have to be closer in. So they're moving like this. So it completes an orbit every 30 minutes. All right. Do we have any other questions out there? I'll just say that we have about three minutes left. So if you have a question you're dying to know either about exoplanets or black holes or star clusters, now's, the now's your opportunity. While I'm waiting for answers on that, I'll just say thank you to Kristen for taking the time to teach us a little bit more about exoplanets and black holes and star clusters. And um, we have two more presentations today, and then we have a couple of more presentations throughout the month of April for the Science Festival. And you can find all of those on sciencefestival.msu.edu for the schedule. And any last words you'd like to say, Kristen? Thanks so much for organizing this and putting it online. That's really great. Oh, you're welcome. And we all say stay safe and stay home and learn some science and practice with your exoplanets and a light source so you can see how they move and how they're detected. All right. And with that, I think we are done for the day. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.